On March 16, 2020, there was a stay-at-home, shelter-in-place order that was given to our state and around the world. And then words like essential and non-essential were now being used. And we were trying to discover who was essential and who was non-essential and what businesses were essential and what businesses were non-essential. As small businesses and restaurants, gyms, shops were now closing all over the nation. And in a matter of days, the stock market plummeted, unlike we've seen perhaps since the Great Depression. Uncertainty and fear, anxiety gripped the nation. And churches, for the first time in history, were now closed. You think about that. The church has been through pandemics and plagues, wars, dictators. The church has been through problems of every sort, natural disasters, but has remained open. But today, for the first time in 2,000 years, the church would now be closed. Schools would now be closed. Seniors in high school would forever miss those golden memories. You see, 42 years ago, I graduated from high school, a long, long time ago in a land far, far away. But even to this day, like many of you, I remember those golden memories like the prom and banquets and celebrations and senior trips and graduations and those golden memories I treasure. And I'm thinking the class of 2020 will never have those golden memories. And then one night, you turn on the TV, and now Atlanta is burning New York is under siege. The White House is surrounded. Again, as I said earlier, as if you were reading a line from the diary of a Civil War general. The White House is surrounded. Atlanta is burning. New York's under siege. And many are asking, what is happening? What is happening to our nation? What's happening to our world? As we see a global pandemic where hundreds of thousands are dying, economic uncertainty, food shortages, violent riots, cities under siege, and two named storms before June 1st. What's going on in our world? What's happening in our nation? What is God trying to tell us? And how do we manage this? Some believe all of this has been predicted. Many Bible scholars will argue the closer we get to the time of the return of Jesus, the closer we get to the time of tribulation, the more we will see the shadows, the squalls, if you will, of the tribulation that's on the horizon. Some will argue the scientific community has predicted a pandemic. Many will argue that years ago, various groups said there will be a pandemic coming one day. Uh, many argued there will be a collapse economically one day. Many predicted civil unrest. Others will argue just the opposite. Others will argue that no one saw this coming. Think about that. When 2020 began, it was a, going to be a banner year, great things, economic prosperity, better than 2019, and many believe that, hey, we were on our way to see greater things happening, and then all of a sudden, we saw the world collapse, it seemed like, all around us. Some will argue that this is a natural pattern, that about every 100 years, there's going to be a breakdown in world order maybe a world war or a pandemic or an economic collapse or all of the above. Some believe the virus was created. Others believe there's simply this is simply the judgment of God. And on and on the debates go. Many believe this is a wake-up call. That this is God's way of saying to the nation, to the world, it's time to wake up. It's time that you come back. It's time that you recognize and realize that he is the God of all creation. Whatever you may believe or not believe, there are at least three things I will argue that we all can agree on. Number one, we can all agree on this, that we are indeed in a unique situation. We're in the middle of a unique crisis, a unique pandemic, unlike anyone has ever experienced. This is one reason why what is right today will be wrong tomorrow. What is wrong today will be right tomorrow. No one knows Everyone recognizes this is unique. This is treating everyone differently. No one knows. This is unlike anything we've ever experienced before. We will realize this. We will know this. This is a global pandemic. This is creating economic mutilation. Major cities are being destroyed. This is unlike anything we've ever seen. All on the same day, we're seeing these things happen. Economic mutilation. Cities destroyed. People dying. Secondly, we can say this, it's affected all of us differently. It's affected all of us, but again, differently. Again, some are anxious and some are angry. 
Some are depressed. Some are so depressed that abuse and suicide attempts and family division are hitting record numbers around our nation. Thirdly, no matter who you are, these events, hear this, have gotten our attention. No matter who you are, you recognize and realize this is unlike anything. Whether you're a Christian or an atheist, we're all asking the same question, what is happening to our world? Again, a wise old mentor said to me years ago, three questions you must always ask. Three questions you must always ask yourself when going through anything in life. What have I learned? What am I learning? Number two, we must ask this question, how am I going to manage this? If this is the new normal, words we're hearing a lot these days, if this is indeed the new normal, how do we manage this? How are we going to do this? How are we going to get through this if indeed this is the new normal? And thirdly, what's God's message to us? What is God trying to say to my heart and to yours? What's God trying to say to our nation? What's God trying to say to our churches? What's God trying to say to our world? The point simply is this. The point is this. We're all experiencing pain on some level. Some of you are experiencing physical pain. Maybe you have not been able to go to the doctor like you wanted to or needed to. Maybe you could not get your prescription filled like you wanted to or needed to. So for some, there's physical pain. For others, there's financial pain. You're not able to pay your bills. Your business has been closed. You're unable to deal with your mortgage. You can't get the basics of life, and you're having these financial meltdowns. Others, emotional pain, mental pain. There's anxiety, there's fear, there's frustration, there's heartache, there's depression, and you're not quite sure how to deal with that. For some, it's relational pain. Things aren't the same between you and your spouse, between you and your children, between you and your coworkers, between you and those that you love, your family, whoever that may be. And some, it's vocational pain. Some of you aren't sure if you have a job tomorrow. Some of you are loving working at home. Some are hating it. Some saying, I need a routine. Some say, I don't want to go back to work. And on and on we go. There's vocational pain, relational pain, physical pain, financial pain, emotional pain, mental pain. And many of you are saying these words, I just want my life back. I just want my life back. I just want life to be like it was at the beginning of this year, 2020. I just want my life back. And many will agree that God is getting our attention because here's what we all know. God gets our attention when we're going through pain. God gets our attention when life becomes painful. During times of pain, we all know this, God gets our attention. The great writer and philosopher C.S. Lewis writes in his book, The Problem of Pain, these words. If you've not read that book, I highly recommend it. The Problem of Pain by C.S. Lewis, and he writes these words. I'm a, I will paraphrase them, but here's what C.S. Lewis says in the book, The Problem of Pain. He says, as I go through my life, as I'm enjoying my life, then all of a sudden disease and disappointment and destruction come upon me. And then I am overwhelmed, he said, by my circumstances, and my happiness becomes like broken toys. He says, I then create a new frame of mind, a frame of mind I should have always had in my heart and life, a frame of mind that says, God, I need you in my life. I need you in my life. God, I need your strength. I need your hope, for my strength is in you. My hope is in you. However, he says, when that threat goes away, I drift back to my old way. And I embrace my old toys. How often have we played that out? How often could that describe me? How often could that describe you? How often have we played out that scenario? We all remember that after 9-11, 2001, the churches were packed. 9-11 happened on a Tuesday, but by that Sunday, every church in America was full. It was like Easter Sunday. People who had never been to church, people who had written off church, people who said, I don't need church, I don't believe in God, they were there in church on the Sunday after 9-11. After Hurricane Katrina, churches throughout our land were packed. People were there worshiping, praising, praying, seeking. But when the threat is over, we go back to our toys. As a psychotherapist, I have seen couples in marriage go through that very same thing. 
I've seen couples in marriage where the husband says to the wife, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. I'm out of here. The wife says to the husband, I'm done. I'm finished. It'll never change. And all of a sudden, the husband or the wife starts doing better. And for a while, things get better. But hear this. We all know that once that threat is over, he or she goes back to their toys. Or maybe there was a daughter or a friend or girlfriend, a sister in your life, and you told her, don't go down that road. Don't go with him. Don't lead that lifestyle. Don't get involved with that guy. Don't get involved with that person. Don't be that promiscuous. And she is going to party hardy because that's who she is. And then all of a sudden she fears she's pregnant. And then she swears and prays, just get me through this. And when the threat is over, she goes back to that lifestyle. Or maybe there's a person that drinks and drinks and drinks, and he doesn't have a problem, he doesn't have a problem, he doesn't have a problem, and then all of a sudden something happens, and he's about to lose his license, his freedom, his job. But when the threat is over, C.S. Lewis says it this way, like a puppy who was just bathed goes back to wallow in the mud pit. You ever bathe the little puppy? What does that, that little puppy do? The moment you bathe that little puppy and you clean it up and you wash it and you perfume it, that little puppy's going to find the closest mud pit. Why? Because that's what little puppies do. Guess what? That's what we do. It is human nature. It is our sinful nature to return to the bad habits once the pain is gone. Mark, what's your point? The point is this. This is why we need church and fellowship, accountability. Bible study, counsel, small groups, activities that are focused on Jesus. Why is that so important? To keep us from drifting back to the habits, to the lifestyles, to the beliefs that are unhealthy and that are destructive. This is why I cringe when I heard people say church is not essential. I'm going, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? It is church. It is Bible study. It is fellowship. It is accountability that keeps us from going back to the old habits that want to destroy us. Because once the threat is over, C.S. Lewis said it right, we go back to our toys. So what is God teaching us? Number one, that this world is being prepared for the return of his son. That things will get worse. I have said many, many times from this stage, Things are going to get worse, and many of you who heard those words believed, but there were some, just trust me when I tell you, that scoffed. Oh, there goes Mark again, sensationalizing everything. There he goes again. And now hundreds of thousands are dying. The White House is surrounded. Atlanta is burning, and New York is under siege. Unlike we've ever seen before. Things will get worse, not my words. How about the words of Jesus, Matthew 24, 22, when he declares, unless he returns, there will be no life left on this planet. In other words, he's saying if he doesn't come back, the world will self-destruct. Like a hurricane about to hit, we are seeing the wind and the rain and the squalls before the storm in this day and age, in this year 2020. What is God teaching us? That the world can change in a matter of moments. That the world can change in a matter of moments. You think about that. At the beginning of this year, economically, we were the most powerful economic nation in the world. We went from this powerful economy of low unemployment, record-breaking stock market, low interest rates. Whether you're a Democrat or Republican, those facts are still there. Businesses were booming. Manufacturing was producing. And now we're teetering on economic collapse as we're seeing record unemployment, stock market plummeting, jobs being lost, business being closed, words like Great Depression being seen and heard, businesses shutting down, schools closed, entertainment denied, no more Disney World, no more sporting events, no more movies, no more gyms, no more life as we once know it at least for the moment. Government overreach, constitutional freedoms being denied, 
I don't know about you, but when I get frustrated, I get sarcastic. Anybody relate that with me? Okay, are you there with me? When I get frustrated, I get sarcastic. So last night, I am watching Atlanta burning and New York under siege and the White House surrounded. And I turned to my wife and I said, there is no one social distancing. No one. Somebody should call the authorities and report these people. No one social distancing. Constitutional freedoms being denied, food shortages, shelves being emptied, and churches closed in a matter of hours. Once again, in 2,000 years, the church has never been forced to shut down like it has in the last two and a half months. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we're seeing things unlike we've ever seen before in world history. And here's what many are discovering when our world changes, hear this, when our world changes, when a crisis hits us, that's when cracks are revealed. Like a heavy rain revealing the cracks in your roof. When a crisis comes, cracks due to neglect in many areas of our life are now being revealed. When a crisis hits, you discover, first of all, cracks in your relationships between husband and wife, parents and children, co-workers, family, extended family, friends, you discover during a crisis just where the cracks are in your relationship. Second of all, you find cracks in your finances. How many times did your mama or your grandmother or a, a financial advisor or your banker say, look, you just need to put away a little bit for a rainy day. But for most of us, we're thinking, hey, we live in America. You know, there's no rainy days here. We're going to be just fine. And now all of a sudden, we discover cracks in finances. Thirdly, we find cracks in our priorities. What's really important, what we once took for granted is now gone. Cracks in our worldview, cracks in our understanding of the Bible. Many are asking, well, does the Bible say anything about this? Yes, it does. Well, where? I don't know. You should know. The Bible is relevant after all. Maybe cracks in our faith as we ask God questions like, God, where are you? What's happening? Please help me. Why me? Why now? What should I do? Here's my point. If today you're wrestling with God, you may want to pay attention to that. Today, if you are wrestling with God, you may want to pay attention to that. Maybe God, maybe God is trying to get your attention in some areas of your life. Maybe God is reminding us that it's our faith that sustains us. Maybe God's reminding us that his word never goes away. Maybe God's reminding us that his church, his people, called by his name, really does endure. In other words, hear this. In other words, our faith, his word, his church really is essential, even though the world doesn't understand that. It's our faith that moves mountains. It's our faith that sees the sea part. It's his word that never goes away. The word of God says the grass may wither and the flowers may fade, but the word of God endures forever. His church, Jesus said, the gates of hell will not prevail. So what have we learned on a personal level? Maybe we've learned this, that what really is important is our faith, our family, our friendships, our fellowship and the fulfillment of his word. Maybe that's really important. Maybe personal disciplines are important, like worship and prayer and fellowship and caring for each other and loving each other and listening to each other and learning from each other. In other words, faith, hope, and love need to be more than just words we say. It needs to be who we are. It needs to be how we are described. Faith and hope. And love. So here's the next question. How do we process this? How do we process all of this? How do we process what's happening in our world, what's happening in our life? Number one, review what God has revealed. Maybe, just maybe, it may be a good time for all of us to pick up this thing we call the Bible and maybe read Matthew 24. Take you about five minutes or less. Or maybe read the book of Daniel. Or maybe first and second Thessalonians. Or maybe just going back to the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, that gives a promise that says, whoever reads this book will be blessed. Maybe today would be a good time 
to review what God has revealed as we enter into this phase of world history. Number two, as you do that, you'll recognize where we are in Bible prophecy. That what is happening is not taking the believer who knows the word of God by surprise. As we recognize what God is doing to prepare this world for the return of his son. Maybe we need to reconsider where we are in our faith, our hope, and our love. And make these realities in our life. Maybe we need to remember what God has brought us through. Do you realize in the last 20 years, and many of you have been here during this time, that God has brought us through terrorist attacks killer hurricanes, a thousand-year flood, a great recession, civil unrest. And we have watched our God bring us through each and every one of these time and time again. We are called to remember. We see that throughout the Word of God. God, through the prophet, says, you know, remember that I brought you through the desert. Remember that I parted the sea. Remember that there was a, a, a time when there, you could not make it, but I made a way when there was no way. Remember I fulfilled my word. Remember, remember, remember. Why does he remind us? Because we easily forget. We easily forget. My dad used to have a saying that went like this. Tell somebody yes a thousand times. Tell them no just once. See which one they remember. Amen. Tell them yes a thousand times. Tell them no just once. And see which one they remember. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, sometimes we easily forget. Next, return to him. Return to the one who loves you. Return to the one who gives you that hope, that life, that love. Return to the one who gives you that promise of a future, of a world where Jesus reigns as King of kings and Lord of lords, and he wipes every tear from our eyes, and he makes all things new. Remember and remind the world that this life, this hope, this future is real, and it can be yours. In the last two and a half months, I've had people call and come by and say, Mark, I'm just telling you, I've got some coworkers." I've got some family members. I've got some neighbors. They don't go to church. They don't believe in all the God stuff. But you know what? They're asking me some questions. They're, they're seeing what's happening in our world. They're seeing what's happening in these major cities. They're, they're seeing what's happening in various other places. And they're wondering and they're worried. And they're asking, you know, what's this all about? And, you know, they're saying, like, you're like a religious person and all that, right? And, and what's going on? What do I tell them, Mark? What do I tell them? It always begins with the basics. Maybe the first thing they need to understand is how to be saved, how to know they have eternal life. Well, Mark, I'm not an evangelist. I didn't go to seminary. You don't have to. The ABCs of faith work very well to anybody you talk to. What's the ABCs of faith? Number one, admit. Admit the fact that you're a sinner. Or put in our vernacular, admit the fact that you're just a big, major, hot mess. Can we just admit that beginning with me? We're just all a hot mess. Number two, believe in the fact that Jesus came into the world, died on a cross and arose from the grave to give you eternal life. And when you believe in him for it, he gives it to you. And then C, call upon his name. Call upon his name. The word of God says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. There's the ABCs of faith. Admit you're a sinner. Believe in Jesus for salvation. Call upon his name. And the word of God says you will have everlasting life. The spirit of God will change your heart and change your mind and give you a faith and a hope and a love unlike you ever knew before. Ladies and gentlemen, hear this. There's ever a time in this nation that people are paying attention to what God is trying to tell us. It's now. But the question is this. Are we waking up? Are we willing to bring revival to a world that's just being basically destroying itself, self-annihilation? Are we willing to bring revival to a world that's turned upside down? Are we willing to, again, wake up to what God is saying? If there's ever a time, now's that time. As hundreds of thousands around the world are dying, As the White House is surrounded, as Atlanta is burning, 
as New York is under siege. Now is the time to bring revival to a world that's dying, to a world that Jesus is preparing for his soon return. May we pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that you will speak grace and truth into our lives today. And that, Heavenly Father, I pray that no matter where we are, what's happening in our life, that right here, right now, we will embrace you as our creator, as our redeemer, as our sustainer. In the middle of a pandemic, in the middle of a time, oh God, where our cities are burning, Lord God, may today be a day of new beginning in our heart and life as we listen to your word, as we sense the power of your presence in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.